I, I grew up in a home with parents for whom the Great Commission was a priority. In the dining room where we ate supper every evening, uh, my mother had taken a big map, a National Geographic map of the world, and she had taped it on the wall. It was the most prominent thing in our dining room. And then she took a felt pen and she wrote across the map, the whole wide world for Jesus. So every evening we would eat dinner, we saw that the whole wide world was meant for Jesus. And I remember one Christmas, my mother coming to my brother and I and saying to us, now I don't want you boys to be thinking you're getting lots of presents for Christmas because your father and I have given most of our money to the Christmas missions offering. In those days, we called it the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Didn't really, sh wasn't really sure who Lottie Moon was at that age, but we weren't real happy with her. But, you, you know, we, we grew up, but we, we didn't experience loss because of Lottie Moon. We grew to love missions because of her. What, years later, when my mother was too weak or too unwell to go to church, uh, and this was her church home, uh, she would say to me at Christmas time, Hamish, get out the checkbook, write a thousand dollar check to the church for the missions offering at Christmas, and then bring it to me to sign it. Now, this is significant because I looked after all her financial affairs and I paid all the bills, and I signed every check, but not this one. She had to put her own signature on this check. So for my mother, the Great Commission was not something to be remembered from time to time. It was the reason for which God had called her and given her new life in Christ. So I know the scripture really well. I've been immersed in a family that lived it. And yet I discover from uh, in living life today that uh, I can be distracted by many of the things in the world. Uh, I can be distracted by my own weariness. I can even be distracted by the many good things that need attention. I can drift away from the main thing. And then uh, I discover in that drifting that my weariness is increased and less and less gets done for the kingdom of God. And so I trust that we will not allow this drift to happen, either personally in our lives or as a church family, that we would keep central the mission of Jesus in the world today. We need these words to remain central in our lives so that we can commit our life's energies rightly. You know, I believe this scripture that uh, Andrew, Andrew read just a few moments ago uh, describes a specific kind of life for every follower of Jesus. And it is the experience of that life that makes it incomparable to any other kind of life. I want to share with you three phrases that describe this kind of life. And the first phrase would be ascent life. Whether you translate that verb go as a participle, so for example, as you are going, or as a command to go, you get the idea. The force of the verb is very clear. We have been sent. We're not supposed to sit and wait for people to come to us or to, make, uh, to see if our situation becomes uh, any better. We're not to be hanging around making our lives more comfortable until Jesus returns. We are a people who have been given an assignment, and it's an assignment that by its very nature requires movement, a movement toward people, for that's where the world of disciple-making is done in the lives of people. Every believer... Every church family needs to learn the truth 
of this verb to go. I sometimes fear that our lives are more sedentary than sent. We spend too much time uh, personally and corporately uh, sitting and hoping and praying that people will come to us. But that was not the way of Jesus, was it? Jesus repeatedly refers to himself as the one sent from the Father. This sentness was something about which he possessed a conscious awareness. It moved him across the landscape into the lives of different people to have conversations with all kinds of people. A woman at a well, a man possessed by legion of demons, uh, a man in a tree. These are all people that Jesus, uh, to whom Jesus was sent. And Jesus would even say of his encounter with Zacchaeus, the Son of Man came to save and seek the lost. At one point in Jesus' ministry, people begged him to stay with them. They just enjoyed having Jesus with them so much. But he said to them, no, I must go to other places and preach there also, for that is why I was sent. And then he would tell uh, a man that uh, he rescued in the tombs, go back, go back to your own home and tell how much God has done for you. Uh, Jesus would say to his disciples, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The sent life is to be the norm for all of us who follow Jesus. But what does it mean to carry with us an awareness that Jesus has sent us into the world? You know, I suspect it has something to do with our orientation to life. It, it, it's not about geography. It doesn't mean that you're going to move every couple of years somewhere in Metro Vancouver and say, well, Jesus has sent me to Coquitlam or Jesus has sent me to wherever, although it may have something to do with that. But I believe it has more to do with the lens through which you see others. Are people placed in your life by God? Or are they obstacles around which you must maneuver in order to get your own things done. I suspect we often treat people like uh, we treat other vehicles we encounter on the road. You know, uh, every single one of those vehicles has people inside them. And yet we don't really see the people, we just see the car. <laughs> and uh, what do we do with those cars? Well. Uh, we, we pass the slow ones. I'm always thinking of that. I, and I'm driving up behind a car. I say, man, this guy's going way too slow. And I'm looking for a way to pass him. And then there's crazy people. You see them come up and they're driving like erratically. And you, you want to say, I'm staying away from that guy. I hope he passes me soon. And, and, but most of them you just sort of ignore. Uh, we're, we're concentrating on getting to our own destination as quickly as possible. And I wonder sometimes, is this the way we view other people? We see them, of course. But do we consider that those bodies that we see contain a soul, every one of them, a soul that has been ruined by sin and is in desperate need of Jesus? You know, the needy people that you meet, irritating people, angry people, the negative, the disillusioned, the exhausted, the anxious, the suspicious, the insecure people, the abandoned people, aren't those the ones we naturally speed by? Or are we mindful that Jesus has sent them to us or sent us to them? Cheerful, optimistic, confident people, they too are equally needful of Jesus, and Jesus sends us to them. Life's, uh, living a life sent, uh, the sent life, it means moving through your day with an awareness that people need Jesus, and you may be the one through whom they encounter him. 
Jesus sends you into an environment, whether that's your home, your workplace, your neighborhood, with the purpose of engaging them in conversations that lead them to him. It means that being sent, we take the initiative in moving toward others. A few weeks ago, I was having uh, lunch with a number of other people in White Rock, and uh, our server's name was Lael, and I was having trouble trying to figure out how to to say that because I'd never met anyone with the name Lael, L-A-E-L. She says, well, just think of whale, and then drop the W, Lael. And I said to her, oh, wow, you know, you have such an interesting name. I've never met anybody with your name before. I said, what does your name mean? She says, belonging to God. I went, oh, my goodness. I said, well, do you belong to God? She says, no, I don't. And I said, well, you know, all of us who just came into your restaurant just now, our names aren't Lael, but we all belong to God. And she was really nice about that. And then we sat down and we had our lunch. And during lunch, I just, my heart felt heavy. And so near the end of the meal, I went up to the, where she was near the cash register. And I said to her, you know, Lael, God has given me this brotherly affection for you. And I think the only reason that is true is because you have this name that says, that means belonging to God, and you don't belong to God. And so it, it, it opened uh, up uh, an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation. And, and then <clears throat> at the end of it, I said to her, here's, here's my card. If you ever need help spiritually, there's my email, there's my phone number, you can text, you call. And, and I know a young woman who, she and her husband are planting a church here in White Rock, and she would be happy, I'll direct her to come and talk with you about Jesus. Now, isn't that interesting? Being sent sometimes means getting up and walking 20 feet from your table to a cash register. Where will Jesus send you this week? Will he send you across the street to a neighbor? Will, will he send you, uh, you know, from your office to another office to speak to a coworker? Will he send you to the telephone to pick up the phone and talk to somebody? Living the sent life. This is our life as God's people. You know, here, here's a display of, uh, you know, Western Canada. It was made uh, by Christians in our family of faith uh, for the 1962 World's Fair in Seattle. And so they have this map here of, the, you know, the Space Needle. And, uh, but what they wanted people to know at the Seattle World's Fair is that Canada needs Christ. I look at this, and I sometimes wonder if our spiritual mothers and fathers were more conscious of being sent than we are today. I mean, look at that appeal. Appeal. Canada needs Christ. So in 1954, the few churches that claimed this Southern Baptist uh, identity, of which we're a part, they had a total membership in all of Canada of 156 people. 156. By 1967, that's five years after this, by 1967, there were 27 churches. Oh, they had 19 in 1962. 27 churches with a total membership of 1,309. So over those years, 
1,190 people had been added to their number by baptism. 91% of their growth had been through telling the story of Jesus to others. Were they less distracted in those days? You know, they didn't have Netflix, right? They didn't have computers and cell phones. You know, you pick up your cell phone 86 times a day, apparently, on average. That means some of you are picking it up 200 times, and some of us are picking it up 14 times. But distractions, were they less distracted than us? I, I'm not sure. But I know that they were focused on the reality of their sentness into their into their environments. This is part of our spiritual DNA. I don't want us to lose that. I want us to nurture it in one another by learning from Jesus, by abiding in him who was sent into the world to give life to to all and now sends us. To whom will you go this week? As followers of Jesus, we must remember that he is sending us out as his ambassadors and as his witnesses. Will you intentionally live your life as one sent with the good news? Because really, Canada does need Christ. Our communities need Christ. There's a second descriptive phrase in this great commission. So we're sent, we live a sent life, but we also live a disciple-making life. So the reason we've been sent is really clear, really clear. Our assignment is to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe, to obey everything Jesus commanded. That's it. That's the reason for our existence as God's people. I don't believe many of us would say, oh no, Hamish, that's not right. That there's some other reason. I, I think we, we're pretty much in agreement about this. And that's really good because as Canadians, we don't agree on very much, right? Like we just, uh, not long ago, we had a federal election. And uh, how, you know, we, we weren't in agreement, <laughs> Right? So, uh, you know, the Liberals got 33%, the Conservatives got 34 this is the popular vote. Uh, The NDP got 16 the Bloc got 7.5%, the Greens got 6.5%, and uh, since the election, we even have a new party, Waxit, right? Alberta and Saskatchewan, they want to leave, apparently. So, you know, we're just divided all over the place. And it's not just politics that divides us. We must confess that as followers of Jesus, scattered about, uh, we don't think alike on every issue. We have differences that have arisen in our lives because of personal history and experience and teaching and understandings of various scriptures. And I'm the first to say that that I don't understand it all. There's, There's a bit of mystery, like God is mystery and And there is some mystery about God and and his world, but there are some things that are really, really clear. (laughs) You know, the fact that Jesus has commanded us that we love one another. Like, that's really clear. We can't misunderstand that. And, uh, you know, we've not come together because we agree on everything 100% but because God has broken our hearts over the spiritual condition of our communities. We labor together, we share our financial resources, we serve one another, we give ourselves away so that people might become followers of Jesus. This is our common mission, to partner With God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triune God, to make disciples of the nations, to baptize them, and to teach them to obey Jesus in all things. Anything else is a distraction to uh, this mission. 
and distractions reduce our capacity to embrace the main thing. And need is not a call. Do you know what I mean by that? There are many needs in our world. Many, and they're genuine needs. Really important things. But our priority must be to answer the call of Jesus. Our mission is not about fellowship. It's not about worship. It's not about service. It is to become disciple makers. Our mission is not about justice. It's not about the eradication of poverty. It's not about, in, about saving the environment. It is not about bringing in world peace. It's about disciple making. Jesus has sent us to make disciples. That is the essence of our assignment. Now, I'm not saying that those many good things that I just mentioned are unimportant. In fact, true disciples of Jesus will care about justice and poverty and the environment and world peace, but not at the expense of disciple-making. When we are distracted by other issues, even really good issues, then people are not led to Jesus and, not, and are not taught to obey him. We save the environment. Killer whales make a comeback, but no disciples are made. We save the poor. We find them affordable housing. But if they enter eternity without Jesus, then all our labor has been in vain. The question remains, if a disciple is one who learns from Jesus how to live life in his Father's kingdom, if a disciple is learning to obey Jesus, then how well are we participating with the Holy Spirit in his disciple-making task? My point is not to define disciple-making, but to magnify the priority of the task in our lives. This is our primary mission from Jesus. Are you investing your life in helping others learn how to hear from Jesus and how to obey Jesus? Are we as a church family nurturing others in joyful obedience to Jesus in all things. You know, isn't it interesting that we, that we dedicated some children today? <laughs> and if you listen, you know, they're just so precious. And if you listen to the prayers and the desires of parents, and you begin to understand that what they're doing as parents is disciple-making, helping their children come to know God and to live lives for Him. And that's what we do as a church but not just our children, our neighbors, our co-workers, people we encounter. Are you serving in some way in our church family so that we might be better at disciple-making? If you're not, I, I just encourage you to find a way. You know, how has God shaped you to participate in this disciple-making process. We need one another in this. We're not making disciples of Pastor Sam. If that was the case, only Pastor Sam needed to do it, <laughs> right? We're not making disciples of Peter or Hamish or anybody else. We're making disciples of Jesus, and that requires all of us working together to reflect the goodness and the glory and and, and who Jesus is to one another, that we would grow up in his image and be like him. And when we do that, God brings about a transformation of people's lives into Christ's likeness so that they, along with we, will naturally do what is right and good before God and to our fellow human beings. And all those evils we wanted to rectify, the needs we wish to meet, are met most effectively as God transforms the hearts and minds of men and women in the disciple-making process. So this new kind of life in which Jesus has called us can be described, yes, as a sent life, and yes, as a disciple-making life, but finally, it is also a Jesus-friended life. 
Now, we could say it is the obedient life, but it's obedience to Jesus. And so I want to call it a Jesus-friended life. And, you know, the grammar isn't so good with that, right? But, it, you know, I, I, uh, I got this from my nephew. So my brother lived as a missionary overseas for quite a few years, and and my, his son, his youngest son, growing up, was exposed to lots of languages but didn't learn to speak any of them right. <laughs> and so when he came back to Canada, uh, his dad was teaching at our seminary in Alberta. And uh, his first week at school, his, you know, his English was just awful. And uh, he came home one day uh, walking with a friend. And uh, his friend was going to his place. And he says to his dad, Brennan says to his dad, Dad, that boy want to friend me. <laughs> I was as English as good as it got. <laughs> that boy want to friend me. Well, the scripture says here that Jesus has friended us. More than that, part of what makes this new kind of life incomparable is not just the glory of being sent. And it's not just that we get to witness the transformation of lives that happen in disciple-making, but it is that ours is a Jesus-friended life. If you look at the context of the Great Commission, you see in verses 16 and 17, the Bible tells us that the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. So who are these disciples who rendezvous with Jesus on the mountain? Well, the Bible tells us some of them are worshipers, some of them are doubters, but they have all obeyed Jesus in meeting him at this particular location. In John 15, verse 14, the Bible, Jesus says this, You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus says that if we do what he commands, we are his friends. These are on the mountain because they were friends of Jesus. Jesus no longer calls them servants, but his friends, because he has shared with them his business. And now he's getting ready to commission them into his business. Really, at the heart of the Christian faith is this friendship. A grace-filled, extravagant, life-transforming friendship. In Christ, God made us who were once his enemies, friends. And here's Jesus, God in the flesh, Savior and Lord, he meets with his friends to induct them into his heavenly Father's business. This redemptive mission was the most significant thing that they would ever be connected to. Eternity would be changed for the better for lots of people because they, as Jesus' friends, were getting involved in his kingdom work. This friendship with Jesus would have a significant impact on eternity. As I think about Jesus saying to his uh, disciples, I've called you friends, it reminds me of one person in the scriptures who is known as God's friend. It was Abraham. The Bible tells us that God promised him a son and descendants uh, that would be numerous as the stars in the heavens. At that point, Abraham was past his prime, and yet he believed God. God's friends do believe him, and Jesus pointed out they obey him. Abraham has already obeyed God by leaving his homeland and following God to a new home, but what really strikes me about their friendship is the way they work together. At one point in their story, the Lord And two men stop by Abraham's place, and Abraham invites them in for a meal. And at the end of the meal, God says to the other two, he says this, Shall I hide from Abram what I'm about to do? And then he goes on to tell his friend Abraham 
what he's about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. He's about to obliterate them. And it is then that Abraham engages God in a back and forth discussion about saving those two cities for the sake of righteousness. Abraham argues with God. He says that God's own righteousness requires him to save those cities and, and save the righteous. And so God relents and finally agrees that if there are 10 righteous people, he won't destroy the cities. Now, of course, we know there weren't 10. And yet, uh, we know that God sends two angels to save Lot, his wife, and their two daughters. And the Bible concludes that part of his story like this. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the catastrophe. God and Abraham are friends. They're loyal to one another. They seek the good of the other. James says of Abraham that his faith and works were a demonstration of a genuine relationship with God, and he was called God's friend. This is Abraham's reputation. All through Israel's history, Abraham was known as God's friend. Jesus calls his disciples his friends. We sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. But the truth is, we can be his friends too. Is there any reason our church family could not be God's friend and demonstrate that friendship by a mix of faith and obedience to the great commission of his son Jesus. Here's the thing about friends. They trust one another. They endure for one another. They believe the best about one another. They will give themselves away, even die for one another. And they do those things with joy. We have a divine divine friend who died for us. We have a divine friend who is with us until the end of the age. We have a divine friend whose life has transformed us and given us a purpose that touches eternity. We have a friend in Jesus who is the most brilliant, powerful, wise person in the universe. Why would we do anything less than what he has asked? Are we friends with the world or with Jesus? Our obedience to live the sent life the disciple-making life, and the Jesus-friended life will show us where our friendship really lies. You know, I know our climate here is not favorable to Jesus. But let us not be dissuaded by that. Let us expand our lives as God's friends ever aware that we have been sent as disciple makers to our community and beyond. Let us do so with all the enthusiasm and joy we can muster, taking heart from the scriptures that show us that those who have labored long before us in the days that we read in the scripture and even the days of our recent past. Let us take heart from those who have labored before us and also struggled with impossible odds, but have shown us a God who is faithful. You know, God has been good to us, infinitely good. Let us resolve then to live this incomparable life of sentness to disciple-making as his friends, until he calls us home, remembering that Canada 
North Vancouver, our neighborhoods need Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that we would be a people that are on mission with you. Help us to see our lives in light of your assignment to us. Father, we confess that it's easy for us to be distracted. It's easy for us to drift, even as a church family, if we're not careful. But we pray, Father, that your heart to redeem a broken and ruined world, to bring men and women and young people life, that they might experience your life flowing through them. Father, that they might experience what Jesus meant by the abundant life, that, Father, that would be our mission, that we would embrace it, that we would revel in being sent by you, and that we would labor with joy in the disciple-making that you've given us to do, and that we would treasure the fact that you have friended us and that we, too, would be your friends. Father, if there are any changes or adjustments we need to make in our lives in order that this would be a true reality in us, we pray that your Spirit would speak to us and that we would be able with courage to make those changes, to repent if necessary, and to enjoy being on mission with you. Father, thank you for what you're doing in our midst and around the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.